life. So I want to thank you all for coming today and uh, for hearing what we have to say about the language, about sex trafficking, how, what, how we see it through our eyes. We want you to understand the damage that language can do when we talk about this issue. We want you to understand how it does impact women and girls, how discrimination plays a role in this, how legalization, all of this plays a role in, in uh, prostituted women's lives. And so we hope to make that very clear for you today. Un, un orden en la, en la presentación. Eh, llegué a la prostitución a la edad de 14 años. Eh, fui llevada por mi madre. Eh, en mi país el tema cultural es muy es, eh, es la prostitución eh, es natural eh, y, y creen mucho todavía en los eh, roles que deben cumplir las mujeres y las niñas a la edad de mis 14 años tuve mi primera relación sexual con mi novio eh, nadie se iba a casar conmigo ya no iba a ser la señora eh, que iba a salir de blanco de la iglesia y considero que lo mejor para mí era que ella me iba a enseñar a trabajar, aunque ella no fue prostituta nunca, pero sí me entregó a un prostíbulo para que aprendiera a trabajar. Um, I got in um, through um, the uh, stripping industry. I um, like when I educate people to talk about how stripping, pornography, prostitution, and sex trafficking are linked. And when we try to delink de them based on interest, meaning money mostly, of organizations like Club Owners Against Sex Trafficking who work with the United States government, ICE to be in fact, that that is an entire slap in the face for me because I know what happens within sexually oriented businesses. They call them SBOs in the United States and, 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 and that's not what that is. It is ex exploitation, it is a gateway into prostitution, it is all of those things and the things that happen within uh, those um, strip clubs are very, very similar to, to trafficking in terms of the mind control that takes place within the industry. Sometimes we call it the life, but I can guarantee you after 15 years of exploitation, um, it is no life to be living, nor is it a job. I too got involved in, uh, in the sex trade through stripping when I was very young. And basically my reasons for doing that was I thought that I was gonna be able to pay my way through college. And so myself and a girlfriend both went and applied to strip at a club in Minnesota. And we were both hired. One thing after another happened, just as, as was just stated to you. And we never did get to college when we wanted to. Eventually, I did. But I'll tell you, it is a, it's a stepping stone into prostitution, in my opinion. Everything was happening in the, uh, the strip club. The men that were there were pretty much just looking at our bodies and choosing who they wanted to buy that night. Um, I just ran into my girlfriend that got involved in the strip industry with me about five years ago. We just kind of lost contact. She went down one road and I went down another. And I happened to ask her, I said, what happened to you all these years? I was 18 years old then. And she told me, she said, you know, my boyfriend just died. What happened to her was while involved, she met a pimp and he turned her out and she just got out at about 55 years old. So this is not a game. Just because it's legal, there's many things that are legal that we know are bad for us, wrong, shouldn't be happening. And I think many times, or oftentimes, people get confused with the strip industry because you can go to strip clubs and it's legal. What happens in there? But it is for many women, we have many women in our organization that got involved in prostitution through stripping. You know, when I say that this impacts all women, and doesn't matter what's being said on the other side, I'm telling you, you have to imagine. If you're married and your husband wants to have sex with you one, two, five, seven, ten times a day, as much as you love him, something in here is going to be wearing down. You're going to say, what's going on here? This is not normal. But yet and still, what we say is that Women in prostitution freely choose it, they like it. How can you like having sex with a stranger? One, five, seven, ten times a day, some 20. You know, international women have told me 40 times a day. There's nothing 
nothing that can make you like that. But I know how the game goes, because I've been in it. You say a lot of things that aren't true. You wear a lot of hats, because you have to when you're in that life. You have to say, it's not so bad, because you won't be able to deal with it if you really tell the truth about it. So I just want you, ladies, to think about this with your loved one, your partner. I want men to think about it. I entered into prostitution as a 12-year-old child. I, I got um, brought in by my older sibling. I stayed in prostitution for about 10 years. I was able to leave. Um, through a traumatic experience. A couple months before my 15th birthday, I was introduced by a couple other young girls who glamorized it, made it seem like this is something liberating, it's something that um, you have control in, and I'd watched my mother be used and abused for many years, and um, so I learned, you know, this behavior through my mother that, um, that this may be the role of a woman to be, to, you know, give herself away in this way. And I thought that money being exchanged would give me some control in this situation. And my story is a very common story. I've worked with thousands of women who have been exploited in prostitution, and I hear the same thing. And that same young girl who introduced me uh, to prostitution now owns three escort agencies in a province in Canada. Um, and I can guarantee you that all of the learned tactics that she used, uh, that were used on her control tactics, she's now using on the women that um, are working in this escort agency. You know, she's never learned how to be an uh, honest, legit businesswoman. There's no manual for her. She now owns these escort agencies and is exercising the same power and control um, tactics that were used on her. Um, I came into prostitution from a situation of homelessness. Um, I was basically a homeless, socially disowned 15-year-old child. And when that is the, the reality that you're living, prostitution um, is one of the very, very few options that you've got. The most important thing to remember is that prostitution happens for the same reason that sex trafficking happens. They both are responding to the male demand for paid sex. They're responding to sexual selfishness. That is how I frame this issue. We have a sexual selfishness on this earth that is causing a huge degree of human misery, and that misery is weighs uh, almost exclusively on women and girls. You're talking somewhere in seven years of prostitution, and I answered the phone, uh, the phones in, in many, many bottles, and I never got a call from a woman looking to buy a man for sex, and I don't think that's surprising to anybody here. This is not about, and never has been about for me, uh, demonizing men. Most men don't pay for sex. Um, in Ireland, where I come from, one in 15 men pay for sex. Um, so we're only talking about a minor minority of men here, but that minority of men are doing a hell of a lot of damage. And I think as to the, the question about what are the links between prostitution and sex trafficking, the, the strongest, clearest link is the punters, as we call them in Ireland, the Johns, as they're known here, because they don't discriminate between a woman who's been prostituted or sex trafficked. They couldn't care less. Well, first of all, what a lot of people don't know about the term sex work is that it originated from the U.S. sex trade of the 1970s. And it was actually a deliberate construction. It was constructed as a rhetorical weapon. Um, and the women involved in, in, in putting that term together, um, what they really wanted to do, and I have to hats off to them, they did a good job. They wanted to normalize prostitution, and they wanted to have it accepted as normal, socially sanitized, regular, everyday work. And they, they knew, of course, that what they needed to do there was shift the language. Um, prostitute, prostitution and prostitute are ugly terms, and they call mental imagery to mind, which is very fitting to, as to what goes on in the sex trade. Um, and of course, this didn't suit them. Um, so the term sex worker was born. And it's just really unfortunate that so many people, well-intentioned people, um, will use that term in an effort to be respectful to the women involved. And I have had that conversation many, many, many times now. I never let that one go by me. I never let anyone refer to me as a former sex worker. Um, so th the question was, why was it harm? How was it harmful and damaging? It's very, it's extremely harmful, just as it was designed to be. 
Um, anything that obscures the truth should be harmful, um, should be seen to be harmful by its nature. And this is not a truth that, uh, of all the truths on this earth, this one does not need to be obscured. Um, so that's where the harm is. And where do we draw the line? There seems to be this slippery slope now where we're now starting to refer to children who sell sex as child sex workers. And uh, I'm not just talking about media, you know, getting terminologies mixed up. I'm talking about uh, groups from the sex work lobby who are actually, um, you know, housing workshops that are paid by, by provincial and federal funds to, um, to have these workshops to teach frontline workers working with kids who are being exploited in prostitution to, um, to refer to them in this way to reduce stigma from their peers. And um, I, I'm sure we can all agree that a child selling sex is, is not a worker of any sort. And um, why does money change things? You know, when a, a child has sex with an adult, um, that's, that's abuse. But as soon as money exchanges hands, now they, they become a, a professional child sex worker. I just I have a really hard time with that. And I think these are things that we need to keep in mind for the future. For Aboriginal and Indigenous women, our younger girls are watching us. So these terms sex worker and that are, are being imprinted in, in their brains at an early age. You've got to understand that in Indigenous women, we come from fractured communities where sexual abuse is rampant. So what we're seeing in Canada are Aboriginal children that are being you know, almost shamed because they're problematic. But, you know, no one's really doing anything. And for Aboriginal girls, it's, they're coming out as young as 10 in some communities. So the term sex worker, I find very offensive because that it wasn't work I was doing, it was hell. El término es inexacto total para ponerle un velo, un disfraz, al delito contra las mujeres, contra la vida de las mujeres, contra los sentires de las mujeres, porque no es ningún trabajo, no es una opción que uno pueda escoger, no es una carrera, no es eh, eh, un comportamiento. El término y, y es un disfraz que le ponen al delito. Terminology is um, really um, about linguistics and how we think about things as human beings. So when you have a, um, a terminology such as sex work, you are implying that there's something about that that is work, that is a regular job. And I can assure you that sex work and that terminology and or sex worker, um, that that as being a survivor, it has nothing to do with work. It has everything to do with harm. It's evidenced through um, the hospitals, through the doctors, through um, many um, types of research that whereby uh, women exploited um, come out with um, many damages. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder being one of them is quite high at the same levels that combat um, veterans come out. Um, th that's not how we operate within a job. And, that, and so if you keep the harms of prostitution and trafficking right up front, the harms and the damages, then what you come out with is there's, that's not a job. There is no such thing as sex work, let me assure you of that. I'm really clear about that. And it's very damaging to a survivor and all survivors worldwide to um, use this terminology. As little as two years ago, I saw a Harvard-educated professor have the term on top of his PowerPoint, adolescent sex work. There is no such thing. There is no such thing as a child prostitute. So when we have the media, particularly in the US, using these terms and many more derogatory terms, um, then that is a problem. Because this is not a job. As Rachel Moran once said, prostitution is a predicament. I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that selling sex at indoor locations is, is any safer than being sold at an outdoor street, in a street corner somewhere. There's absolutely no difference. I have been prostituted in escort agencies, massage parlors, street corners, and I will tell you that the, the, the men who purchased me through escort agencies, um, they felt that their, their money owned me. They would sit by a clock and, 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 and monitor how much more time I had. If there was five minutes left, I was there five more minutes. <laughs> 
um, giving them, you know, fellatio or whatever it is that they, they had me there for. There's no difference. These guys, when they're enraged, um, they're not thinking about uh, the, the front desk, the women at the front desk. They're not thinking about the pimp. They're not thinking about the managers and these so-called body, these imaginary bodyguards that we're hearing about. Um, <laughs> they are enraged. When you have emotions that are heightened, which they are heightened through uh, intimacy, um, when things don't go their way, and remember, we're talking about men from very diverse backgrounds, men who have different entitlement issues when it comes to women, um, and they all respond very different. You know, we're not laying down in bed with a bed of roses here. These, these are men who believe that they own us. And um, again, when they're enraged and these emotions are heightened, they don't care who's out, out front. They're thinking in the moment. Um, the serial killers, serial rapists, you know, they're not, they don't care what the current legislation is. Right? They're not abiding by laws. That's why they're killing people and raping people. And so keep in mind that this is not about packing shelves or, or flipping burgers. This is women who are laying down with complete strangers on a nightly basis. And, and sure, some women have regulars. I've heard the argument that, well, you know, there's, there's nice guys out there. And sure, there's some nice Johns and there's some uneducated Johns. And that's why we're here today, because we want to educate Johns, not to be Johns. But, um, but regulars, uh, these sugar daddies, um, they, they have the same control issues as, as any other John. You know, um, condom use, for example. Uh, we've heard uh, people talk about um, how legalization will make it safer for women through the use of, of condoms. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had a John slip a condom off without my knowledge, or poke holes in condoms, or offer me an extra twenty or a thousand dollars to have condomless sex. And you know, keep in mind the people who are selling sex are in very various desperate states or survival states or, you know, a hotel to pay for, a mortgage to pay for. And, um, you know, if they, if they offer you at this at that one moment where you're, you're down and you're desperate, you know, you're more likely to take that offer. In order to help people understand the harms of what prostitution has done to women and girls from all over the world, language is important. We have to use the right language when we talk about it. We can't candy coat it. It's got, we've got to keep it real. And I always tell people, prostitution is about a sex act. That's the bottom line. And, and it affects every woman and every girl. It really even affects men because it makes a statement, for one thing. It says that women and girls can be bought and sold, which in my opinion is an extension of slavery. And it has to end. So how do we do that? How do we really do that? What I want to do is I want to get change this conversation here. And I want to get into talking about the Nordic model. I want people to talk about the impact that the Nordic model would have. Some of you might already have that in your countries where, where it's legalized, where prostitution is legalized. I want you to talk about the impact of that and what that would look like. The Nordic model is the political and legal structure through which the demand for paid sex is itself criminalized so that it is a criminal act to go and um, pay somebody for any kind of sexual act. Um, it's a gender neutral law, so I as a woman, if I decided to go into a brothel looking for a man, I would be just every bit as um, legally culpable as any man out there. Um, it, it, the detractors of the Nordic model like to try and pick holes in it, of course, and that's one of the things that they say, that it's, um, it's unfair on the poor men. Um, it is a gender neutral law. Um, so. Uh, the other aspect of it, it's kind of like a twin prong process approach um, to eradicating prostitution. If it was simply about criminalizing demand and that's where it ended, um, I would have a lot more to say on it and I would be recommending actually the second part of it which is in existence, which is that um, exit strategies are opened up for women and girls. So had the Nordic model been implemented in Ireland through, during the 90s when I was in prostitution, not only would the men who have been um, buying myself and the other women and girls I worked alongside um, have been committing a criminal act, but also I would have had the thing that I most desperately wanted, which was um, education and training. Not every woman will want or need the same thing. Some women will be mothers, of course, so they'll need help with childcare. Other, you know, people like myself, homeless, would need help with housing, and so on and so forth. So those tailored packages of exit strategies for women and girls are absolutely crucial in order to give them 
another alternative. So that's what the Nordic model is. It shuts down the demand on one side of the scale and it opens up the avenues for exit on the other. Now, the Nordic model is in, um, it's, it, it's in operation now in Sweden, Norway and Iceland. Um, a 15-party committee of Irish politicians unanimously voted in June of last year that we implement the Nordic model in the Republic of Ireland. Um, a similar bill, the criminalisation of demand, has been discussed in Northern Ireland, which is a different um, political territory, so that if they go ahead and vote for that, well then we'll be shifting this into the UK. Um, France voted recently also. so. In Ireland and France, we're going to see those structures um, within the, before this year is out, please God, and if not, then very soon after. So what's happening now is the Nordic model is actually shifting down from the Nordic countries into Europe um, for the first time. And like I've said before, I am seriously hoping, um, with no offence to anybody from the Scandinavian countries, <laughs> that it will lose its title. I'm really hoping that... Um, this will be the global model sometime real soon. And the demand is paid rape. We need to get that terminology out there. It's paid rape. It's not enjoyable for the sellers. What the Nordic model will do, what I'm hoping it'll do in Canada, is it'll protect those vulnerable women, which are Aboriginal women with mental health, the women that are voiceless. You know, I'm not, you know, I don't want to segregate the high-end girls, but we have a major diversion where it's only a minuscule few, few of high-end uh, women who are thriving from prostitution based on women that are vulnerable. And that's what we're hoping the Nordic model will protect, our vulnerable. I'm from the United States, and um, what I think that... Um, we're dealing with here in in the United States sort of really does go back to that whole um, you know false notion that uh, that this is a choice of some kind. Um, it's sort of the social and cultural norms within um, our society here. And according to a study, um, 85 to 95 percent of women wanted to exit um, immediately but lack the options. What the Nordic model will do. That was by Dr. Melissa Farley of Prostitution Research and Education. I uh, always like to give credit where credit is due. Um, so in terms of the, of the demand, um, I think some of the problems here in the United States are going to be um, the way that we view um, the upholding of the male-dominated status quo within our political system. Why do I know that that may be a problem? Is it, it comes from my lived experience as much as my professional experience. Um, the splitting in between a, a child and adult, um, you know, um, using education. I'm all for educating the buyers of sex. Um, what I'm not for is in lieu of prosecution, because there is studies out there that say if the t deterrence and the punishments for buyers of sex include fines, jail time, D deterrents are designed to hurt. The ones we have in place right now don't hurt enough because it's growing, not shrinking. Um, so it's fines. It's jail time for buyers and not for the exploited women. Um, education should be paid for directly from sex purchasers, not our government. Um, and certainly not um, from other agencies. So... Um, and what needs to happen with those fines is that we then funnel those services back into for the exploited so that we have resources. Because I can tell you on first hand on the ground, there is not enough resources to help exploited individuals nor give them real options. And I think the Nordic model um, legislation will help with that. But we need real options. And convincing our government uh, to, to let go of the status quo is going to take a survivor-led movement along with the many women and agencies such as Equality Now and Coalition Against Trafficking in Women um, to, to really take this on. And many of your agencies, we've got to really, really advocate for this because we're coming up against the status quo. In Latin America, and specifically in Colombia, eh, un país que lleva eh, 50 años de guerra, donde hay eh, eh, sobrepoblación de hombres armados, 
donde el poder legislativo, los que legislan, los que ratifican las leyes son hombres consumidores eh, de, de esto. O sea, el modelo nórdico para nosotros eh, creo que es un sueño, es un sueño muy lejano. Lo que nosotras consideramos que tenemos que hacer hoy, ahora y ya, es entre todas y todas eh, a ayudar, apoyar a las víctimas, a las sobrevivientes, eh, a disminuir el daño, a disminuir el, 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 eh, los traumas que han quedado y a trabajar muchísimo en el tema de la prevención en las nuevas generaciones mientras nos llega el modelo nórdico.